Good morning, everyone. Looks like we have quite a few folks joining online, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We are limited on time today, so let's, let's hurry up and get going, right? Can everyone online hear us okay, or is the echo pretty bad? Shannon, since you just said. Yeah, the echo, the echo is not bad. It's just boomy, like, you know, a large room would be. So I think I, I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Let us know at any point if that changes. I'll just say it's not, it's not completely clear. There's not really an echo. It's just the, um, because of kind of the boominess of the room, it's, it's not super clear coming through. Thank you. Is that no, um, there is a, we have two microphones in the room and I'm thinking that's what's causing it, but let's go ahead and get started. I will try to speak clearly and folks who are up after me, if they could do the same, that'd be great. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Harbage. I'm the Public Policy Director at Montana Department of Environmental Quality. I just want to start by thanking everyone so much for joining us this morning. It's exciting, really exciting to see so many people signing on in the room and also online to learn about subdivisions and regulation in Montana. The purpose of this seminar, as you probably know, is to provide information about the various parts of the subdivision review process, why it's important, and how some of the key entities in the state are working together to improve the application and review process. Our hope is that we can bring together key stakeholders to learn and start a conversation about subdivision review in Montana. We recognize that there are many different perspectives relating to subdivisions. We also recognize that Montana is seeing unprecedented growth and we're struggling to keep up with that growth. <coughs> I just want to start this, this morning by saying we're all in this together. Um, I think we all want to meet housing and development needs and we want to do that in a safe, environmentally protective way. So today's seminar will focus on information sharing, not debate over any particular part of the seminar subdivision review process. In the interest of time, we do have several presenters who will be rotating through, and I just ask that everyone hold their questions until the panel Q&A at the end of the presentations. At that time, if we do get log jammed or stuck on a particular topic, I will move the conversation along so that we can make sure that we're hearing everybody's questions, because I know we do have a lot of folks um, who may have questions for us today. Before we get started, just to cover a few Zoom logistics, this is a Zoom webinar. So the folks online, um, I have promoted the folks who will be present, presenting today to panelists and everyone else should be muted. If you do have a question, you're welcome to type it in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll address it when we reach that part of the agenda. Like I said, we'll get to that under the panel Q&A at the end. At that time, when we get to the Q&A, you can also raise your hand um, to be called on to ask your question aloud. One more logistical point, and I did put a message about this in the chat already, but for those who missed it, we are going to be emailing certificates of completion after the seminar to folks who need continuing education credit or professional development hours. So if you would like a certificate, if you could please indicate that you need one in the chat, um, just leave us your full name and we will get that to you after the seminar. I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Steinmetz, now former Division Administrator of the Water Quality Division, and she's going to give a few remarks before we get going. Thank you, Rebecca. As Rebecca said, I'm Amy Steinmetz, and I was the Water Quality Division Administrator a couple weeks ago. And I have now switched over to the Waste Management and Remediation Division, but I am still seeing through some of the pieces from the subdivision efforts that I had going on when I was in the Water Quality Division. And I just want to talk a little bit about the last phrase under the meeting objective here, how we're working together to improve the application and review process. So you'll hear from some of the speakers today about rulemaking efforts, you'll hear about stakeholder outreach that we're doing, you'll hear about some steps that DEQ is taking to reduce our, <laughs> reduce our backlog and get back to statutory review time. As Rebecca said, you know, development is up in the state and we are really struggling at DEQ to keep up with reviews. We are shorthanded. 
and we have multiple things going on to help address those things. But as far as those collaborative efforts go, as you'll hear, multiple agencies at the state and local level are involved in subdivision review. We all recognize, all of the entities involved do recognize the need to work together to improve communication, to improve collaboration, to improve efficiency, while protecting the environment and doing what's in the best interest of Montana's communities. Some are long-term efforts. We're looking at statutes. You'll hear about three separate statutes today that affect subdivision review. We can make it hard as things change in one, then there's an inconsistency with another. So we're looking at making all of those consistent, but that's a long-term effort. Um, but for the short term, we are developing some tools that will help our customers in the short term. And a couple of examples of those are some workflow that will be very easy for our customers to follow, that will show who to contact at what point in the subdivision review process. And another uh, short term tool that we'll be rolling out hopefully in the next uh, couple months is consolidating application materials for subdivision in one easily accessible location so that people aren't trying to wonder where they need to go for this piece of the review or that piece of the review. We want to get this consolidated and make it much easier for people to uh, know where they need to go and where to get the right information. So with that, All right, I'm going to go ahead. You want me to just, okay, since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the folks who will be speaking to you today. All of our panelists, they'll be doing the individual presentations and then at the end they'll come up for the Q&A. So at the county, we have Shannon Terrio, and Shannon is online. She's from Missoula County. Beth Norbert is in the room with us. Brittany Kahn is online. With DEQ, we've got Marguerite Torres-Thomas. Susan Baden, Eric Trum, Eric Regensberger is online, and Scott Patterson is in the room with us. So, and you'll see all of their, their names again, and they'll probably find which section they're with or who they're with. Um, from the NRC, we've got Nate Ward online with us, and then from Mako, Karen Alley is in the room with us. And as you already heard, our facilitator today is Rebecca Harbage. And I don't plan on saying much to the names on this slide, but you're for me. So this is the agenda that we'll be covering today. We are currently doing the welcome and meeting overview. And next, we'll move on to the Subdivision and Planning Act. And I'll have Karen Alley come up and talk about that for us. Good morning. Um, my name is Karen Alley. I'm Associate General Counsel for the Montana Association of Counties. Um, and I've been asked this morning to give you, um, to provide an overview really of the what and why of the Montana Subdivision and Planning Act. So um, to go back 49 years, uh, the Mo Montana Subdivision and Planning Act, as we know it today, was introduced into law and uh, passed through the legislature in 1973. Um, the, the actual Senate bill that was under was Senate Bill 208. Um, at that point in time, in 1973, the legislative purpose of the Subdivision and Planning Act was to promote public health and safety, general welfare by regulating subdivisions, of land, as well as to prevent overcrowding, lessen congestion, provide for adequate air, water, uh, light, encourage development and harmony with the natural environment, and provide for uniform monumentation of subdivisions. So, uh, if you go back into the legislative history, and, and honestly, if you go into the Montana Subdivision Planning Act today, you will see these legislative purposes still uh, encapsulated in the statute. Back in 1973, the uh, Subdivision of Planning Act was sponsored by Senator John, uh, John Turnish. Um, in reading through the minutes of the local government committee, which reviewed this act, um, he said the stated purpose was to bring order out of confusion with plain subdivisions, as well as clarify the, the role of, of local government. Um, prior to this point in history, um, 
a, a lot of the testimony that was heard before Congress. Before the, the Senate at that time was about how land subdivisions were happening with very little local government oversight, as well as very little regard for any sort of safety standards. This was a widely supported bill uh, at the time. So uh, Hal Price, who sat on the, uh, on the state planning board at the time, stated that Senate Bill 208 was designed to deal with problems that result in poor subdivisions. Rick Mayfield, uh, who was on the Bozeman City County Planning Board, um, provided illustrations to this to the local government committee um, that that showed how in Gallatin County at the time subdivisions were going in with little to no concern for roads or drainage or sanitation standards, and how uh, the state needed to fix this issue. The Gene Anderson from the League of Women Voters um, stated in particular that this act brought orderly community growth and enabled governmental services to be economically supplied. Um, and also, always, when we're talking about uh, putting new uh, ideas into law, we're also talking about how um, these are going to be supported by tax dollars. So uh, one of the other overarching parts of the passage of Senate Bill 208 was how this will be a more efficient use of tax dollars. A little bit more history. In 1973, uh, when they passed the Subdivision and Flooding Act, it really only applied to divisions of land for plus 10 acres or less. Um, and that was obviously the most controversial part of the bill. It started as a proposal for 40 acres, and then through negotiations and amendments, it went down to 10 acres. That was quickly changed in 1974. This was when the legislature was still meeting every year instead of uh, one biennial. And in 1974, uh, division, the Subdivision and Flooding Act did that. Did that applied to divisions of lands that are 20 acres or more, or 20 acres or less. Um, and that definition has, the amount of acreage has sort of ebbed and flowed throughout the years. However, in 1993, we have the present de definition of what constitutes a subdivision under the Subdivision of Fighting Act, which is 180, 160 acres or less, which cannot be described as a one quarter output part of the United States government section. Basically, we talk about 160 acre or less division split. And since 1993, that definition has remained and has not changed. Under our current uh, Montana Subdivision and Fighting Act, the overarching goal is really twofold. Number one is government regulation and development, both at the local and at the state level. Uh, prior to 1973, there was uh, Local government had a minimal role, if any, for human subdivisions. Um, the other part of the goal is public participation in community growth and development. Um, Senate Bill 208 in 1973 uh, included a public participation part in the subdivision review process. Specifically, um, this act puts into requirements for local governments to adopt regulations um, governing subdivision, and they put in as the the legislature at that time put in a specific uh, requirement for public participation and development of those regulations. And I would say that these goals uh, were important in 1973. I would say that they are still important today and for the and two of the tenets of the subdivision of the environment. This act has um, been amended many, many times in the last 49 years. Um, will continue to be amended, I anticipate, as we uh, try to address different issues within growth and development in the state of Montana. Um, the current iteration of the act, I, I provided you at the outset with the first sets of legislative purposes. Um, and since that time, uh, the legislature has added in additional uh, intent and additional uh, purposes for the act. Um, which is the you know such as the preservation of open space, the promotion of cluster developments, uh, protection of the rights of property owners, and for, um, providing for phase developments. So um, we still have all the original 1973 purposes of the act, in addition to these four, which have been added throughout the years um, between 1973 and 2020. Realize this print is small for those who learn, but. One of the important 
um, parts of the Montana Subdivision Planning Act is that uh, it lays out requirements of uh, what each governing body, which each local jurisdiction, whether it be a county government or a municipality, um, the regulations, what the regulations must provide. Um, because not only is the Montana Subdivision Planning Act governed by state law, it's also governed by um, local regulations as well as state regulations, and there is an interplay between those two. But at a minimum, um, each governing body's subdivision regulations must uh, provide for orderly development, coordination of roads, the dedication of land or roadways, and public, public utilities, uh, road improvements, um, adequate provisions for open space, adequate transportation water and drainage, um, that adequate transportation water and drainage being critical of what we're talking about today, as well as provisions for the regulation of sanitary facilities, the avoidance of, the avoidance of congestion and um, the avoidance of unnecessary environmental degradation, degradation by other things. Um, what I want to point out is that some of this language uh, in what's required of the regulations really came into play in 2005 um, in Senate Bill 290, which, yeah, um, which added in this language about uh, regulations, um, local regulations, subdivision regulations required to um, provide provisions for water supply and sewage and solid waste disposal. Um, as well as uh, requiring that the regulations adopted by the Department of Environmental Quality for subdivisions, um, creating 20 acres uh, for less than 20 acres, as well as standards for uh, when parcels are between 20 and 160 acres. So I'll get into that distinction here in a minute. But in 2005, um, we see the legislature adding in really this sort of critical information on water supply, so we just all the waste disposal. Um, and that being a requirement for what the local government bodies that subdivision regulations actually have to provide for. Stepping back to a more uh, high level view of what um, a, a local government considers under the Montana Subdivision and Planning Act is that the local government has these primary statutory criteria that they analyze in reviewing any sort of subdivision application. So in addition to um, water and sanitation, a local government is also looking at impacts of a subdivision on agriculture, on agricultural water, with user facilities, the local services, um, and how, you know, talking about sheriff's offices and um, hospital capacities and those sorts of things, the natural environment, wildlife, wildlife habitat, and public health and safety. Um, so whereas uh, many of the uh, stakeholders in this room, uh, particularly with the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation of the Department of Environmental Quality are really focused on water and sanitation. A local government body has to look at all of these impacts um, on, on the specific development and how it's going to impact the, the community as a whole. So as I said, the role of local government is to analyze those impacts and determine whether or not there are any of those impacts have are adverse um, in those primary review criteria. Um, we are able to, the local governing body is able to mitigate any sort of adverse impacts um, with conditions of approval. But um, the, the role for the local government is, is to work with the subdivider as well as take community and public participation um, into account to determine what is a significant adverse impact. What, how does this, this specific application for a subdivision adversely impact any one of those seven uh, primary criteria? In doing so, the local government relies not only on what a subdivider or developer provides in an application or any of the expertise they bring forward, but they also rely on what the public brings forward. In the state of Montana, we have a very uh, low first public and a very active public. Um, and uh, a, a lot of times, uh, public participation and, and what the public brings for a local government body um, is critical in, in determining whether or not to approve or conditionally approve uh, a subdivision or deny subdivision. So, like I said, the public does play a crit critical role in the community, uh, in community growth, not only in the development of regulations or in the development of a growth policy, um, but in these site specific application reviews. Because, again, um, 
whereas as a developer is, is expected to provide as full an analysis as possible of the impacts that their subdivision will have on um, the set of criteria. Um, the public also has sometimes very different opinion on, on what would be a significant adverse impact. So specific to uh, sanitation, um, when we are talking about sanitation and subdivision review, we're actually talking about two different definitions of subdivision. So when we're talking about subdivision at the local governing level, when we're talking about the Montana Subdivision Planning Act, we're talking about divisions of land that are 160 acres of us. When we're talking about who reviews um, water and sanitation, there's a distinction. And the distinction comes um, under Montana Code Annotated 76 or 102. Um, and uh, the distinction comes between parcels of less than 20 acres and parcels 20 or more acres. So less than 20 acres, um, review is completed by the Department of Montana uh, Environmental Quality um, with regard to water and sanitation specifically. Parcels over 20 acres um, for water and sanitation specifically are reviewed by a local by the local board of the local sanitary working together. Um, subdivision applications overall under Title III Montana Subdivision Planning Act are required to provide preliminary water and sanitation information um, that's spelled out in section or in Montana Code Annotated 6 or 763622. Um, and specifically, uh, the local governing body. Um, even if the local governing body is not going to be issuing the certificate of subdivision approval, if that is going to the DEQ, the local governing body in their review of a subdivision still needs to take into consideration that there's evidence of water, adequate water availability, um, evidence of sufficient water quality in accordance with rules adopted by Montana DEQ, as well as a preliminary analysis of potential impacts to groundwater quality. Um, so, Really, this is where a lot of overlay starts to occur between the local review and Montana Department of Environmental Quality Review, um, because it, it really is, there is really a preliminary determination made by the government body. I will say that um, local governing bodies are able to condition approval of a subdivision with lots under 20 acres, um, they're able to condition approval of that subdivision on the Montana Department of Environmental Quality issuing a certificate of subdivision approval. So while they may get a conditional approval, in order to meet conditions of approval, the applicant then needs to seek approval from the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. Um, as part of the review process, um, the local governing body collects public comment related to water and sanitation review, regardless of whether the application is actually going to be forwarded to the Montana Department of Environmental Quality or whether it's going to be sent to the board, the local board of health and sanitary for review. Public comment is, is collected uh, by the local government body. Um, and I would say that that is kind of again, looking at those two tenets of the Montana Subdivision of the Climate Act, um, where we're talking about orderly development as well as public participation. Again, that just underscores the importance of the level of public participation within the Montana Subdivision Act. So with that overview, I will turn it over to the next. We're going to try to fix the audio. We're hearing from folks online that it is pretty echoey. So one minute. So you can just try to unplug that. <laughs> For those of you in the room, if you haven't already noticed, there's coffee and treats in the back. So this might be identified to stuff snack. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, that sounded a little bit better. Yeah, I, can't, I mean, it, it, it isn't a giant improvement, I don't think. Um, can you talk a little bit more? We are trying to move the owl a little bit closer, so our microphone is closer. Does this sound better? If I start to read the slide, you can let me know. Montana Subdivision and Planning Act. Does that sound better? It, it sounds a little bit better to me. Uh, I, um, it, it's just a kind of boomy room, I think. It is a big room, so I don't know if we'll be able to fix it beyond this, but let us know. Eric, thanks for the note, and if it um, still sounds pretty bad during the next in-person presentation, let us know, we'll try again. The next one should be online, so it'll be great for everyone. I think up next, we have, we're starting with DNRC and we've got Nate Ward who is joining us online. He doesn't have slides, he just has an introductory slide. There you okay. go, just leave it on that. Perfect. It's all you, Nate. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so my name is Nate Ward. Um, I am the Bureau Chief for the Water Rights Bureau of DNRC. And today I'm gonna to talk about water rights uh, and how they relate to DNRC subdivision review. And specifically, I'm gonna be talking about uh, permits and exceptions to the permitting process. And so I wanna start off with the purpose of DNRC's review. Um, we are reviewing the water needs of a subdivision to determine if the subdivision is going to require a new permit for water use or if, based on the proposal provided to DNRC, they would meet a exception to our permitting process. And so this is really important because all beneficial uses of water require a water right. And so we need to make, make it very clear what the water rights needs are going to be um, because depending on the, the water right need, it really informs what the process is going to be. Um, and so just a little bit about the, the subdivision review that DNRC does. Um, we, we don't look at any parcels at or exceeding 20 acres um, for the subdivision reviews that, that DNRC does under the DEQ, DNRC, MOU. Um, and so this matches what DEQ is gonna be reviewing. Um, and so the, the DNRC review is gonna be limited uh, to when new parcels are being created. And so, like I said, you know, our concern is, is the current water uses and future water uses. And so what we're doing in our review is we're providing a determination uh, of the water rights needs based on what the applicant's plan is as, as they provide it to us. And so we're gonna provide a letter that's gonna explain how much flow rate and volume are gonna be assigned to, to each tract or parcel um, for the, the proposed project. And we're gonna state whether the project meets the exception to the permitting process, or if a permit is gonna be required. And so those are very two very different processes. Um, so the permitting process, uh, it's in statute, uh, Title 85, chapter two, it's in part three. Um, this process is a lot more involved, a lot more complicated. Um, in a lot of areas of the state, it can require mitigation water for uh, due to closed basins. And so uh, the permitting process can take up to a year to, 
to navigate. And so it's, it's really important for us to identify early on as somebody's going through the subdivision process, whether or not they're gonna need a permit because that is going to inform their timelines and, and really help inform them in what they need to be thinking about as they go through the process. Um, whereas the exception is, is an exception to the permitting process. And so what that allows for is actually the water to be put to use and then a water right is filed on that, that new use of water. Um, and so the, the big difference between permitting and the exception of the permitting process uh, outside of the timelines and, and, you know, getting a water right in place prior to putting it to use or putting it to use and, and uh, then filing is that the exception doesn't have a statutory review criteria like the permitting process. And so if somebody is meeting the exception to the permitting process, they, they complete their project submit a correct and complete application to DNRC and then statute says DNRC shall issue. Um, and so there is a, a very limited review for correct and complete uh, when it comes to the exception process. And so now I really wanna focus on the exception process um, because I, I think that can be confusing for a lot of folks. And so what is the exception? Well. The exception is written into uh, Title 85, Chapter 2, and it's, it's uh, Section 306. And so this allows for developments of groundwater up to 10 acre feet of volume without requiring a permit. And once again, if you meet this exception, you can put the water to use and then file for your water right. And so a big component of that exception to the permitting process that, that plays into uh, subdivisions is combined appropriation. Um, and this term only applies to groundwater exceptions to the permitting process, uh, very narrow scope. And so when I, I say that, if, for, for those of you that are familiar with, with water rights, um, this would be water rights with, with the title of groundwater certificate on the top of it. Um, it's form 602. And so the combined appropriation is applied when multiple groundwater developments are used as part of the same project. And so there's been some confusion about what constitutes a, a project. And so uh, back in March, DNRC, provided clarification in our guidance on combined appropriation to really help better uh, define what, what a project is because there was, there was confusion over uh, spacing of groundwater developments and how they relate to a project and, and whether or not spacing applied to subdivided parcels. And so the clarification in this guidance didn't change how the spacing was being applied. It, it really just was uh, some, some word changes to ensure consistency in how spacing was being applied on a project. Um, and so that spacing only applies to 20 acre or larger parcels. Uh, the spacing is one quarter of a mile or 1,320 feet. So, if you have a parcel that is 20 acres or larger and you have multiple groundwater developments that are quarter mile apart or more, they don't constitute a single project. Um, when it comes to, to subdivisions and what DNRC is reviewing, because remember, we're not actually looking at 20 acre or larger parcels. Uh, so when it comes to, to new subdivision projects, and uh, the DNRC review, um, spacing is not gonna apply. Uh, so any new, newly created lots that are less than 20 acres of size, uh, take the, the footprint of that, that subdivision and all of those new lots are considered one project. 
And so that one project for the entirety of that development, in order to meet the exception to the permitting process, they would have to, to stay at 10 acre feet of water or, or less in order to meet that exception. Um, and so, so once again, just to, to reiterate, uh, for subdivided properties um, that the DNRC is gonna be looking at, if the total use under the exception of the permitting process is, is gonna stay 10 acre feet or less, um, we're gonna consider it one project and it is considered a combined appropriation. Um, and so an, an important part of DNRC's review to, to, to make this determination is we have to look at what existing water rights are out there. You know, in, in some cases, uh, when we're reviewing new proposed subdivisions, there are existing exceptions already in place within the boundaries of, of that property being subdivided. And so those are going to uh, count against that, that 10 acre foot limit. So if you've got an existing groundwater certificate within a, a new subdivision and it's gonna continue to be used and it's, it's using two and a half acre feet right now, you're gonna be limited um, in any new uses to, you know, seven and a half acre feet uh, in order to meet that exception. So if, if the new uses are seven and a half acre feet or less, um, you're, you're going to continue to meet that exception. Anything larger is going to require a permit. The applicant is going to have to go through the permitting process and that water right is going to have to be in place before um, you, can, you can get a COSA written through DEQ. Um, and so I, I guess to, to kind of wrap all of this up, um, I, I want to bring to attention that uh, DNRC is, is currently looking at our subdivision reviews and um, we're coordinating with DEQ to update the, the form that we're using to get those subdivision requests. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to, to make things more clear for people submitting these, these subdivision reviews on what we need for, uh, from them, information from them on the proposed project, you know, existing water use in, in place within the boundaries of the, the uh, newly subdivided property and trying to, to standardize that to make sure that it's clear what we're asking for. And uh, with that, then we're, we're trying to coordinate with DEQ as well on the, the review letter that we're putting out so that they're all looking the same. And um, obviously each project is gonna be a little bit different, but we want the formatting to be similar. We want information to be found in the same locations. And so for those of you that are working in different areas of the state, the idea is, is we want that consistency. You know, we want it coordinated so that if you're you're working on a project in Bozeman, the the requirements and, and what we're asking from you for information is going to be the same as if you are working on something in Missoula or Great Falls or Lewistown. Um, and so yeah, really the intention is we're trying to make it more clear and and straight, straightforward, streamlined, uh, and coordinating with DEQ on, on what is important. And then uh, also I wanna to touch on just uh, some work that, that DNRC is, is doing right now. So we are currently going through uh, an overhaul in our, our water processes. And so we're, we're reviewing basically everything we're doing um, to, to look for efficiency improvements and you know, see where, where we can provide more clarity on a process, you know, looking for ways we can streamline processes, make things more straightforward, you know, get better information out to people. Um, and 
one of the things we're looking at with this water process overhaul is uh, exceptions to the permitting process. And so we have a, a group of stakeholders uh, that are, you know, widely represent uh, stakeholders throughout the state. Um, and so this changes, mitigations and exceptions working group uh, of stakeholders is going to be looking at exceptions to the permitting process. And any recommendations from this working group is gonna be used to inform any proposed future changes in combined appropriations and how that's applied or uh, changes to the exception process. And so that's all I have for you. Great, thank you, Nate. Let's try something different. <laughs> Margaret, I think you're up next. If you're like, yes. Yes. All right, thanks, Nate, for that talk. And next up, we've got Marguerite Juarez Thomas with DEQ. So we're going to try something different for sound. <laughs> Seems like it's always an experiment. <laughs> You'd think that by now we would have all been really good at Zoom, but it is seriously different every single time. <laughs> So I don't need to talk to the microphone. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> No. Can you hear me now? Testing? Maybe no? Hello? Yes, we can hear you online. Thank you. We can hear you. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm Marguerite Rose Thomas. I am a section supervisor for the public water subdivision section at the 2 uh, We administer the subdivision, sanitation subdivisions act. And I'm going to talk about that now. So this is process, and that's me. Um, so this is kind of we could put this at the beginning of the talk, but these are the different um, overlapping regulations that we deal with with subdivisions. So the Sanitation and Subdivisions Act is what our group administers, and it's under 764 MCA, um, and then we have subdivision rules that are adopted under that. The Public Water Supply Act is for any. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more, but for a system that serves 25 or more people more than 60 days per year. Um, and so those are under 756. And then the public water rules, the only one that really applies to plan review is 1738.01. Uh, the Water Quality Act is another uh, part of that is where we get non-deg from and not degrade state waters, 75501. And then the local boards of health under Title 50 adopt a section of our regulations um, in general. They, they could not, but they do. <laughs> and so that's under Title 50, and that's where second permitting comes from. 
And then you've heard about the subdivision of the Vatican Act, which also has to do with that. Let's see. Okay, so, and then, you know, you heard Nate talk about the water rights piece. So that's another coordinating piece, but it's not actually one that we consider to be in that parallel track, but it's certainly something that needs to be addressed. And so um, in 2014, we came out with 1736-103, uh, which has a provision for a letter from the NRC stating that there is a water right um, or that it is exempt. And, you know, it's, it's sufficient for the use of codes in the subdivision. And that came about because there were times when certificates of subdivision approval were issued, and people later found out that they didn't have water rights to begin with. It's a little confusing for me. So it's better this way than we coordinate with the NRC. Um, so, uh, as Karen mentioned, there is a difference between the Planning Act definition and the uh, Sanitation Act definition. Of what a subdivision is, mostly around the number of acres. So our rule only applies to parcels of land less than 20 acres. And then, as there's another caveat about condos and permanent spaces for mobile homes or RVs, which can be on any size lot. So one of the things that we do when we're talking about coordination efforts is the Sanitation and Subdivisions Act has a provision for the EQ to contract with local counties to review subdivisions that are under their purview. And so we coordinate with that um, with monthly meetings and, and other things. And so this is just um, um, the senator and talk about this more later, uh, but this is sort of a, it's a contracting effort. So it sort of blurs the line between who does what, but they are subcontracting with us to do that. And these are the contracting counties. Uh, most counties really like having the local review process, and it does that for right things and takes some people off the BEQ. So, uh, this is our somewhat, um, this is probably the, the most straightforward slide of what we do in the subdivision review process. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that the application is submitted. Uh, now there's a step where we give an indication that it has all the pieces of the application. And if it doesn't, then we send it back to the consultant and say, try again. Um, and then when it does, or if it just has that information when we receive it, we say yes and we move into the full review. Um, so the DEQ has 40 days, contracting counties have 30 days for that because there's a there's a 10 day sort of uh, QA QC check that we do on the contracting county files. Um, so then the reviewer has the option to approve or deny. If it's approved, it gets approved. Um, kind of rare for that to happen on the first go round, but at least not have some um, items hanging out. But it's not that uncommon for them to be approved the second time. Uh, then, so if it is deemed insufficient or it's a denial letter, then the clock stops and Nothing happens on the EQ side until we get some more information from the consultant. Uh, landowners can submit subdivision applications. It's not prohibited, but it's generally pretty difficult for them unless they already have an engineering background. Um, so then, if it's, you know, then when we receive information, if we get information back in 30 days, then it's a 30 day cycle for us to get an answer back to them. If it takes longer than 30 days, then we take more time. If we don't get a reapplication within a year, we have the right to abandon the application and start over and take these care. Uh, we're not super hard on that one. <laughs> uh, so, and then the next thing is, so, okay. so we are not currently meeting those timelines um, outlined in statute uh, based on a, um, originally, we did not have enough subdivision reviewers. I hired eight additional sanitarians to help with that. And uh, we have recently entered into a contract with another. Um, and then, like, so that that made those timelines for those non-engineered subdivisions much faster than it would have been. And we're pretty close to meeting those timelines. Um, but what happened after that 
was that we lost three experienced engineers in the program. And so now the engineering side of the house is kind of going out. Um, so this is this has been a, a big priority at DEQ and I think with the governor too. So these are our strategies to improve timelines. The obvious is hiring. Um, I did hire one additional engineer. Um, I hired one a couple months ago and I'm ready to offer the position. That will be all of our vacancies and we can't have any more um, unless the government gives them to us, which I'm not sure about that process. Um, the other thing we're looking at are pay adjustments and overtime. Engineers are not allowed to earn overtime, um, but it would make it easier if we could do that as opposed to contracting out. Then we've explored more about the career path from an engineer in training to a professional engineer. Currently, you know, we need to have a group of experienced engineers to teach those engineers in training. Uh, so that is one barrier to that. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is Within the EQ, we have some other engineers that have uh, expertise and could do these reviews. Um, so we're looking at doing some job sharing there, which we'll have some use. And then technology, we are moving forward with an online application submittal for subdivisions, um, should go live in July. And all it is, is it's, um, this is very simple. We looked at a more complicated solution and discovered we could afford it. So this is a very simple, straightforward, um, idea. It's an online form with a subdivision application, just the way it is on paper. Um, and it and then it allows people to upload a document. Uh, pretty straightforward. And um, as a feature that is better than what we currently have now, it will auto generate an email to tell you that we received it and we'll be looking at it and we'll let you know. <laughs> So those are some good automated features. We, we implemented trying to do this um, with a human, but it's pretty hard to find enough time to do that. So what's the other? Contracts, we're working on a number of contracts. Oh, we're running out of time? Okay. Um, so contracts and making rules more efficient and funding and efficiency, which are all kind of self-explanatory. Um, so, oops. These are the things that we look at in subdivision reviews. We want a drawing of what's there. We want to know that it meets our setbacks. We want to know that it's not the greatest state water and the storm drain is really a problem. I'm talking too much, which is weird. <laughs> okay, and then, so the big thing about subdivision review is, is your system um, individual, shared, multi-user, or public? Um, and add, to add to that, these definitions have kind of moved around a little bit over time. But certainly the, the public and the multi-user piece are where you would be a professional engineer. And so those are the, the good lines there, but not all public systems are professional engineer. So, but it does change the way that the review is conducted. So that's usually the first question that I ask people when they call about the process. So these are our rulemaking priorities. We're working toward um, that rules that will fulfill these ideas of red tape relief and things that have come up in administration. So then the, the task force is the body that we're using to review those rules and provide us with comments in a more informal setting. And I think that's been pretty good. And then we did break into subcommittees to have a little detail of each proposal. So there's two phases to our rule package. Phase one, which is moving forward, should be adopted in February of 23. Um, so it looks at subchapter one, which is sort of general requirements. Um, portions of subchapter three, it's not noted on the bottom slides. Um, and then we made a new circular um, B20, which will cover non public systems, individual shared and multi user, as opposed to having them lumped in in D23. For phase two, um, the subcommittees wanted to take a little bit more time to look over those changes in rule. So we're doing that in, in as part of a separate rulemaking, and those should be adopted in November of 23. Um, so those are subchapter six, which deals with deviations of laborers and exclusions, subchapter nine, which um, is what the counties adopt, and it deals with on site wastewater. DEQ4 is the design standards for on site wastewater. Um, and then we have to move things around in sub chapter three to make it all line up. 
And then the Q8 is the stormwater circular, um, trying to simplify some of that and um, add more detail about what we are requiring in other areas. So we're also going to turn non day. It's currently a policy or a guidance. It will become a circular and we'll be adding some things to that to make it more straightforward. That. And so currently we're sort of paused on this phase two piece because we are trying to catch up on applications. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Marguerite. Looks like next up we have Eric Regenberger, who is also going to be joining us online. So Eric, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that your video can be seen by folks in the room. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, can you throw up my slides? Okay. He just has slides. Yeah. Here's I can share my screen. Hang on just a All righty, go up one slide or two to the start. All right, Eric, hang on just a second. That'll work. That'll work. All right, so um, my name is Eric Regensberger. I work with DEQ. I'm going to talk about our non-DEG process um, for subdivisions. Next slide. <laughs> um, so brief overview for subdivisions for, for septic systems. We look at nitrogen and phosphorus. We look at nitrogen impacts to uh, groundwater and surface water uh, when it's close enough. And we'll discuss that later, the exact criteria. Um, and then for phosphorus, we look generally at impacts to surface water. Um, the reason we only look at phosphorus for surface water is because it doesn't, um, it doesn't exist in groundwater at concentrations that are harmful to to any any groundwater use um, that's typical for you know for 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 groundwater uh, withdrawals it's very low concentration it tends to absorb to soil um, and the reason we look at surface water is because it takes a lot less phosphorus and surface water to impact the surface water than it does groundwater so so that's the, that's the reasoning behind that. Um, next slide. So the, the basics of our groundwater view for nitrogen, um, groundwater uh, mixing zones. Um, basically, we allow the effluent from the septic system to mix with groundwater, and you get what's called a mixing zone, basically dilution in the groundwater in a defined uh, location and distance from the drain field and using calculations of uh, of the groundwater um, you calculate the, the concentration of the groundwater and in the mixing zone um, 
We have non-degradation limits um, for nitrogen, which are a, a portion of the groundwater standard. Uh, the water quality standard in DQ7 is actually 10 for non-degradation. The limit is five or seven and a half at the end of the mixing zone. Um, five is for regular systems and 7.5 is typically for level two systems that treat nitrogen better. Next slide. So just a, a quick graphic looking from above, basically uh, the drain villa on the left, groundwater flowing to the right, and your mixing zone is shown, shown there. It extends out. It, it gets a little wider as it goes down gradient due to uh, groundwater e effects. And then you have to meet the, uh, the, the limit of five or seven and a half at the end of that mixing zone. Um, and they usually range from 100 feet to 500 feet long. Next slide. So this is just kind of the same diagram from the side, how, how it's uh, envisioned to work in, in, in the real world. Drain fill leaking down through the, through the unsaturated zone, hits the groundwater, and then your, your plume of wastewater um, moves downstream and mixes with the groundwater. Next slide. So for phosphorus, um, the basics of phosphorus review is we determine uh, the pathway of the effluent through the soil. Uh, it goes down vertically until it hits a limiting layer, which can be groundwater or bedrock or a confining layer. And then it moves horizontally and we calculate the amount of soil theoretically that the, the effluent will, will be in contact with. Um, we know soil has a certain amount of absorptive capacity for phosphorus. We apply that, that absorptive capacity. And basically, if you, if you have enough soil between the drain field and your surface water, whichever surface water that is, receiving surface water, um, if you have 50 years of absorptive capacity, um, that, is, that is sufficient. And I mean, th this is a way to account for spe site-specific soil conditions depth to the limiting layer, um, et cetera, versus what many, um, uh, many other states do, and they just have a, a setback, a standard setback that doesn't account for the site-specific conditions. So um, this, this, this method uh, does account for that, provides that, that extra layer of um, site-specific detail. Next slide. So for for surface water, so uh, again, for nitrogen, we do groundwater and sometimes surface water. For phosphorus, we just look at surface water. Now, if you meet that 50-year criteria that, that I just mentioned for phosphorus, then you're done with phosphorus. You don't have to do anything else. Um, if you don't, then you have to go to this method. Um, and same thing for nitrogen. Um, there's, there's a couple of criteria regarding when, when our surface water review is done. First of all, uh, for nitrogen, if the drain field is within um, a quarter mile of the receiving surface water, then we have to have to do this calculation and, and we call it the trigger value. And I'll get, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. It's called the trigger value calculation. If the drain field is, is between a, a quarter mile or a half mile from the surface water, then it depends on the soil type. Um, in that range, um, soil types that have faster percolation rates. So if, you're, if your application rate is a 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or 0 0.8 gallons per day per feet, and that's from DEQ4 for soil specific, described in DEQ4, I should say. Um, or if you have a limiting layer, uh, such as uh, groundwater or, uh, or bedrock or uh, a confining layer that's less than eight feet deep, um, then you do have to run this calculation in the quarter mile to half mile distance. Um, and it's, it's, it's somewhat similar to the groundwater uh, mixing zone we talked about. You, you let the effluent of nitrogen and phosphorus mix with surface water, and you have to be below, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. And you, the, the mixing that you use, the volume of mixing that you use for surface water is based on what's called a, a 7Q10 or 14Q5, basically a statistical low flow stream value that occurs once every either five or 10 years, depending on which, which one of those two were that were using those statistics. So once you do that calculation, then 
the criteria is that there can be a no more than a 0 0.01 increase of nitrogen in the surface water after that mixing, or for phosphorus, it's a 0 0.001 milligram per liter increase. So that's that's an increase, not a resulting concentration in the water. Um, and this is this criteria, this trigger value criteria is specific to each development. So a subdivision, so different phases of the same subdivision, they're all done cumulatively with regards to this, this calculation. Next slide. So using our, our MPDS, um, or not, not MPDS, uh, MGWPCS, the Montana Groundwater Permitting System, um, I just pulled up a few, few examples um, of uh, what, what can happen when a wastewater system is not operating properly like it's supposed to, and an example of when it is operating properly. So properly operating um, septic systems that are, that are designed, uh, built, maintained, operated correctly, um, those are the ones that we, th th that's the purpose of our review to keep our groundwater and surface water from exceeding any of the standards. So next slide. So here's an example of a facility um, again with a with a with a permit from from the department, and the orange is the orange dots are the measured effluent quality from the system. The orange line is the permit limit where it's supposed to stay stay below. Um, this is a actually a package MBR plant, so it has a pretty low effluent limit of 10 milligrams per liter because it's it's able to treat that well through the through the through that process. Um, and you can see there are some exceedances, you know, that happens. Um, some of these are, are in the winter, which is more common. It's, it's harder to get the, the nitrogen um, treatment to occur in the winter because it's a, it's a microbial process. And if your wastewater is a little bit cold, that process um, does, does get uh, retarded a little bit. Um, but overall, you can see it's working quite well. And most importantly, as you can see, the, the blue dots are the groundwater monitoring down gradient of the facility. And the blue line is the limit, 7.5, as I mentioned before, for groundwater. And their, their monitoring shows they're, they're staying well below that, that criteria. So the, the system is working, and the monitoring shows that, that we're staying below the, below the limits. Next slide. So here's, here's an example of a system that isn't working quite as well. Um, goes back to 2008. This, this system was installed, had some issues with overflowing, and I don't know if that was maintenance or it was just people were putting a lot of stuff into their toilets that they weren't supposed to, and it was winding up in the, in the, in the, in the drain field. So in 2009, they, they replaced the system, and you can see after 2009, it worked worked quite well for several years, but but then around 2015 or so, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but um, they started going up. Um, and it took a little while in the, as you can see in the blue again, the, the groundwater monitoring well, um, the groundwater concentration has eventually <clears throat> lately risen above the uh, 7.5 limit in the standard, same limit as the previous uh, system. So. This shows if you do, if it's not if the system isn't properly operated, maintained, or or um, or constructed. Um, in this case, it it may be more related to maintenance. It could be overloading because it did work for the first several years after it was installed. Um, but now we're seeing the effects down down gradient in the monitoring well where the the nitrate limits are are well the most recent was above twenty, which is which is well above the seven point five limit. So. That's that's it for me. Right, thank you, Eric. Next up, we have Scott Patterson, also with DEQ, with our Public Water Supply Bureau.
Okay. Hello, can you guys hear us now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Um, Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Scott Patterson. I'm the nitrate um, rule manager in the drinking water public water supply bureau. And I'm going to talk about um, the nitrate pathogens contamination we see in drinking water wells. So first, I'm going to start off. Sorry. First, I'm going to start off with drinking water health standards. The Safe Drinking Water Act sets the health standards for the quality of the drinking water served. So that's specifically looking at the water quality of the water at the tap, not necessarily the source. Um, these health standards are then adopted into the subdivision rules, or some of these say are adopted. Two of the ones I'm going to look at specifically today are nitrate and coli. Um, nitrate um, is one of the forms of nitrogen um, that, that, that Eric referred to. The drinking water standard, or we call maximum contaminant level, is 10 milligrams per liter per parts per million. And the, the health concern for nitrate is that infants under six months of age can get what's called blue baby syndrome. They consume water in the asset, excess of this health standard. And then for the pathogen we're looking at is E. coli, um, the, the MCL is just present and suppose an absence is present in all of the water sample. And that has um, gastrointestinal um, stress, diarrhea, vomiting, um, a bunch of other complications. Um, so those are the two we're looking at specifically, but I want, also want to talk about the types of contaminants we, that we can classify as. One is acute, and so an acute contaminant is um, a person consumes a single dose over the health limit, it can cause illness and potentially um, untreated death. And so the example we're talking about E. coli and nitrate fall in this category of acute contaminants. Conversely, we have chronic um, contaminants, and that's where an individual consumes water in over this health limit for an extended period of time, and it can cause illness after the fact. Um, and so the extended period of time can be months, years, or even decades. Um, the EPA does a pretty high level statistical analysis to determine the health limits for chronic contaminants and its overall uh, is several liters of water per day over several decades for one person's lifetime. Um, and think examples of that are arsenic, benzene, and lead. Um, so the health implications of acute versus chronic um, contaminant are significant. And so looking at um, looking at nitrate pathogens and their presence in, in the in public water system data in Montana. And so I'm just going to stress that again, this is from data from public water systems that are, as um, Marguerite mentioned, they serve more than 25 people, more than 60 days a year. Um, and we have they have ongoing regulations to sample in a regular um, occurrence as long as they're active. And so first we'll look at nitrate. And so we have about 2,200 public water systems in the state and over 25% or about 25% of them, so over 500 systems have nitrate levels that exceed background. In this case, it's defined as three milligrams per liter. This is an indication that we have some groundwater contamination going on. And then about a little under a dozen public water systems every year have exceeded the MCL at 10 milligrams per year. And that is a, a, an acute contaminant to health concern. And the major sources volumetrically nitrate in drinking water and groundwater is one fertilizer, two animal manure, three human sewage, and then lastly, natural deposits, um, which is pretty insignificant in the state. Looking at the table, the graph, oh, sorry, the map in the upper right hand side, this is data from 2018, and the red circles are the public water systems that exceeded the MCL um, that year. And then the yellow diamonds are systems that had nitrates between five and 10. 
And so it just shows that we have um, a presence scattered across the state, a double concentration and a bias of data towards areas of higher density of people, um, but it's definitely present across the state. Um, jumping down to the pathogens, um, we sampled total coliform in the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's like we use that because it's like a group of bacteria that is easy to analyze in the lab. It includes both pathogens and non pathogenic organisms, but it coli's in there as well. So we get a total coliform positive sample. It indicates that there's a like there's a possibility of pathogens in the present. So of those 2,200 water systems, about 13%, or about over 250 systems every year, test positive for cold form, and about seven have um, had E. coli positive samples. And so we have presence of um, pathogen in the drinking water. Sources of these pathogens are human waste, animal manure, and then naturally present in the soil. On the, the, the map on the bottom, is from June of 2018, and the red uh, diamond on that image is the one system that had coli positive that month, and then all the green ones had total coliform positive samples. Again, it's scattered across the states with a bias towards places with higher um, population density. In summary for this slide, we do have a presence of background nitrate across the state. Um, and we are getting um, systems that exceed the MCL and have E. coli positive, and we have total coliform present across the state as well. So, um, this is kind of building on what Eric was talking about understanding how septic systems and um, their influence in the groundwater. So, in, in the image on the top, we have a schematic cross section of a house that goes to a septic tank. And then to um, a drain field off the right, and then the mixing zone would be even further to the right. That's not the really cool. On the far left hand side, we have a well going down to the ground, and the arrow showing groundwater both from left to right. And the three points I want to stress on here is the types of waste. So, first of all, septic systems handle human waste, which contain both nitrate and the pathogens, like E. coli, that we're concerned with that because they're of acute nature. Number two, well proximity. So the well and proximity to septic system, in, the closer they are, the highly likely they are, they are to actually have contamination from that well. We have a 100 foot control zone around the well, and ideally in that 100 foot control zone, the total circle around the well, you would have no source of contamination be stored as like you would store fuel. Um, you would not be applied used to put your like fertilizer in that or fertilizer or um, um, or herbicides or anything like that. And then thirdly, you wouldn't have any wastewater facilities within that water flow control zone. And then the third thing I want to stress is siting considerations. Um, wells should be sited up gradient or hydrologically up gradient of the of always for water facilities. Um, this is easier to do at the individual lot set scale, scale, but once you kind of go bigger and look on what an example is, trying to build this in with your neighbor's wastewater and drinking water systems makes this can make this very difficult. And so here's an example of a public water system as a daycare and look at the neighbor's green field. So the image on the left is an air photo. Um, that shows brown as the property boundaries, the brown lines. The yellow boxes with the hash marks are drain fields. And then we have three wells um, in there with large 100 foot control zone circles that are either yellow or red. Groundwater flows from the upper left corner to the bottom right, the general groundwater flow direction. The daycare is the red group in the middle of the image, and their well is a young red circle. And that's for the location of the well. If we then jump to the graph with the red box around it, that is the nitrate, historical nitrate data for the daycare as well. And you'll notice from the late 1990s to about 2020, it was under five milligrams per liter, but it was above factor three for the most part. Um, a little bit of variance in there. And so it's pretty stable. Um, in 2001, the neighbor's drain field. The neighbors to the south, they reorganized that property, they put their drain field downfield of the house. 
Um, and you, as you can see on the image to the left, the drain field extended into that underfoot control zone. Soon after that was in operation, the, the nitrate level in the data care exceeded that MCL 10 milligrams per liter, and it's bounced around around that 10 for, this, for the following quarters. Um, the neighbors to the south crop their drain field at the underfoot control zone. Um, soon after that, but the nitrate level is still really high. The um, other thing I want to point out is the nitrate levels historically were not zero. They were elevated to the background, and there are potentially three different drain fields and mixing zones that could be contributing nitrate to the daycare, including their homes. And so part of this is understanding the complexity of just having one property site and understanding with the neighbors in there how this can aggregate fill upon the nitrate concentration. Currently, the, the daycare is pursuing different options and looking at nitrate treatment. Um, in summary, nitrates and pathogens are acute contaminants with a significant health concern. On-site wastewater is a significant source for these acute contaminants. And then design considerations can reduce those impacts to human health. Um, specifically, siting wells are upgrading the wastewater and then maintaining that critical control zone. And then, lastly, I put a pitch in. We have this creative underground comics slides of DEQ prints this that goes in more detail of what they're explaining how these different septic systems and drinking water systems the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if anyone wants copies of that, we are more than willing to provide those. Thank you. Next, we have Eric Trump, and he is with our Water Quality Planning Bureau. Hi, thank you. So, yes, my name is Eric Trump. Um, I manage the non point source and weapons program at uh, Montana DQ, and that's part of the Water Quality Planning Bureau. So, just so I'm going to talk about surface water impacts. I think this is going to be pretty quick. Um, mainly focusing on some of the, the septic impacts we're seeing in surface water within a lot of our planning documents. Um, but I wanted to just jump into kind of our, our process and where we fit in, in this whole scheme. So again, I'm in the non-point source and wetlands pro, uh, program, and that's kind of the, the end of this circular diagram here. It all starts with our water quality standards and modeling program. They develop the water quality standards for surface water. And as Eric and Scott kind of talked about, that's pretty distinct from the groundwater standards. The groundwater standards are meant to meet, be protective of human health. While surface water standards is uh, protective of recreation and aquatic life beneficial uses. And those, it, it all ties into the growth of algae in the stream. The growth of algae is influenced by the amount of nutrients in the stream that allow them to grow. So those are significantly more, um, are, are lower, lower standards than for the groundwater. Um, so just kind of moving through our programs, we have we developed the water quality standards. Um, our monitor, our monitoring assessment folks go out, monitor water quality. They look again when we're talking about nutrients, they look at total nitrogen, total phosphorus, as well as algae growth within the stream, um, and those, as well as some uh, macro vertebrate data. So looking at the combined chemical and biological impacts um, to surface water. Um, kind of along the process, we have our TMDL, or total maximum daily load section. They develop these planning documents, their TMDLs, we, we call them um, they basically define the amount of, of pollutants that can be in the water while still meeting those beneficial uses, again, tied to recreation and aquatic life. Uh, those documents also um, identify the, the sources of pollution through modeling and monitoring efforts. Um, and finally, uh, it goes into implementation. How do we implement improving water quality? Um, so a major point here is the distinction between non-point source and point sources of, of pollution. 
So I'm in the non-point source program. It's diffuse sources of pollution coming from you know, stormwater runoff, agriculture, as well as septic systems. Septic systems are considered a non-point source. Um, point sources are things like a wastewater treatment plant, which require a permit to discharge into surface water. Non-point sources are not regulated in that way and implementing practices is voluntary. We provide um, some support, um, technical and financial to help, help folks address some of those impacts, but that's a, a major distinction that I just want to point out. Point sources regulated through discharge permits, non-point sources are require voluntary action. Um, so I just wanted to point out a couple examples um, of some of the source identification, specifically to um, septic systems through some recent documents. This is from the Flathead Stillwater TMDLs. They're actually completed in 2014, which hard to believe is eight years ago. Um, but those TMDLs focused on nutrients, sediment, as well as temperature. Um, and these diagrams are from Lower Ashley Creek, the, the same segment that the wastewater treatment plant discharges to, and there's some contributions from there. Um, it's called the MS4. It's the, the regulated stormwater for the city. Um, so that's the, the point source allocation for nitrogen and phosphorus up there. Um, those are combined. Um, but really what I wanted to just point out was um, the nitrogen, the relative um, contribution of septic systems um, for total nitrogen. And I'll say the phosphorus has been updated through our, our modeling. Um, the, the allocation or the, the relative contributions of these sources of pollution um, are done, we're done through a larger modeling process. Um, septics rely on the means model. It's the method for estimating the attenuation of nutrients from septic systems. It was a model developed by Eric Ravensberger. Um, and it really uses soil type at the septic system, soil type um, near the stream, and then the, the total distance. So really the, the treatment relies on that distance between um, the system and the surface water for those reductions. Um, the phosphorus is being updated because we got updated uh, soil data and as Eric kind of went into um, some soils absorb uh, phosphorus better than others. So it's actually treating, um, septic systems in this area are actually treating phosphorus fairly well. And you know, in the next example, I'll give kind of drives on that point. So I guess that's that's about as far as I'll go into that. In a couple in a second, I'll talk about some of the stuff we're doing up in the planet there. Um, but a more recent um, project we worked on, um, Hannah Riedel in my program worked on a Bitterroot uh, protection plan. Um, the Bitterroot River is not impaired by nutrients. Unlike Ashley Creek, uh, so but it's right on the on the cusp. So we wanted to put out some information on um, some of the loading to help inform um, local stakeholders on uh, opportunities they can they have and that they can take to address that big systems. So she, Hannah ran a similar ran the means model um, and and did a relative source assessment of, of different sources. And I'm again here just focus on the nitrogen side because um, phosphorus is very minimal um, loading from septic systems during that. And we're looking at it during the growing season. I guess I should mention that the surface water standards only apply during that um, growing season, the July to September timeframe. So, you know, just, just pointing out, I guess, the Big points here are that um, septic systems are uh, contributing to um, keep contributing nitrogen to the Bitterroot River, um, and this is three segments, as you'll see there. Um, so, wrapping it up. So, some of the stuff we're doing um, up in the flathead, we have a cost share program that we set up 
um, with multiple partners up there, um, including Lake and Flathead counties and the conservation districts, lots of watershed groups. Um, there, we're doing a cost share to get people to pump their septic systems, maintain, and really using that as a, a broader education and outreach. Letting people know, some people don't even know they have a septic system. So letting them know they have it and they need to maintain it and potentially upgrade um, their system. Um, we're working with the Flathead Basin Commission. They've developed these septic risk maps. I won't go into detail on that, I'm running out of time here. Um, but again, education and outreach material and helping to inform the county on, on areas where development may have a greater contribution to surface water contamination. Um, so, um, and I guess the other big point, the map on the left there shows the relative age of a lot of these systems. And a lot of those systems, I think 30% of the systems up in the planet are over 30 years old. And that's beyond the life, the typical life of a septic system. So at that point, you can get failure often into somebody's basement, but it can be a failure in the stream, which would be a huge, not just nutrients, but also some of the bacteria. Um, that's about all I have. Thanks, sir. Yep. Next up, we've got Susan Bond with DEQ's Enforcement Program. You're getting short on time. So, okay, I, I talk really fast anywhere. Perfect. I actually have notes that say slow, slow, slow down, <laughs> slow down more. <laughs> um, and I should just be able to use the arrow keys. I can do that yeah. and it will work. Um, as Rebecca said, my name is Susan. Oh, that's right. <laughs> my name is Susan Bond. I am with the DEQ Enforcement Program. I'm an environmental enforcement specialist. And I am also the enforcement liaison to the subdivision review section. Um, I also work with the engineering bureau, bureau overall. Uh, and I've done water quality. <laughs> Um, what I am, so on your agenda, it says that I'm talking about stormwater, but as I was going through um, what everybody else was talking about, I thought it might be more meaningful to see how enforcement fits into this process and the kinds of things that we see as a result of failure to have a subdivision reduced. Um, so a little bit of background so you kind of get where we are. Enforcement is the complaint hub for DEQ. So we receive complaints for all of the medias that DEQ regulates, media that doesn't that DEQ doesn't regulate, and also calls about people's neighbors being aliens. Um, we take these and we, we dish them out to who it belongs to. We handle the rest of them. The graph you're looking at is the number of complaints that we've taken regarding subdivisions. This graph goes from January 1st, 2008 to December 31st, 2017. In this graph, you can see that with the exception of the pocket move in 2012, <laughs> um, we have, you know, somewhere I say somewhere between 20 and 40 complaints a year. We've got a slight downward trend. And then growth starts happening. These are the complaints we've taken from January 1st, 2018. And the blue line you can see under the 2022 column is what we have taken as of June 1st of this year. So we've taken 39 complaints already. Um, and we're on track. If we take that by a month to month basis, we're on track to take 56 more complaints this year. That's a very conservative estimate because right now we're just getting into our peak season for complaints. And when you see all of the construction that's occurring and all the growth that's occurring, I suspect this might be more. In fact, since I pulled these numbers, I've already taken three more complaints on that. So, <laughs> uh, but what you can see is we have a huge upward trend on this. Um, and so I'm going to show you um, how this relates to the importance of subdivision review. I'd also like to point out that those number of complaints are only complaints that were identified specifically as subdivisions. We also get complaints about stormwater that go back and relate to subdivision review. 
We get complaints about septic tanks that go back and relate to subdivision review. Um, we get complaints about groundwater pollution, surface water pollution. It all can, so much of it is related back to subdivision review, but they're identified primarily as something else. Um, so these are just numbers that are usually a violation of their COSA. So why is subdivision review important? <laughs> if you put an office and a parking lot on your property and you don't go through review and you haven't thought about what happens when it rains or the snow melts, you're likely to flood your drain field. Um, if they have gone through review, they would have had to put in permanent stormwater controls to prevent this from happening. They have caused themselves a huge, huge issue now um, that's going to cost them a lot more money than if they've gone through review. Um, this is one of our <laughs> infamous, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Um, this is one of our infamous Bach and Man camps. Uh, they, people just came in, somebody had a big part of land, they came in, they parked all their RVs to go out and make all their money on the oil rigs. What they didn't do was go through review, determine how these are being serviced water-wise, how sewage is being handled, how stormwater is being handled. Again, when that snow melts, we could have just an environmental catastrophe on our hands if they've drilled well, it may get flooded. If they've got septic system, we don't know, it may get flooded. Um, and you can see there's a marshy area at the bottom. Um, that's a state water, and we may end up with contaminants in state water. Um, this, is, this is a storage facility being built. Somebody knew how to pour concrete, they knew how to put up the, the steel. They didn't go through review and they um, put this on top of the train field for the restaurant next door. Again, they've now caused themselves all sorts of problems that are going to cost them a lot more than it would have been to send some plans through. These are all complaints that we have received to handle. Um, this one is a facility that used a municipal facilities exclusion saying they're going to, to hook up to municipal water, sewer, and stormwater. Um, and that prevents them from having to go through review because they're going to public facilities. What they didn't do was design their stormwater controls within the subdivision appropriately. And when you have a massive rainstorm, this is what happens because there was no place for the rain to go. Um, and I would like to say that also because they, it was designed poorly, where you see a dirt road, that's actually paved because they had nowhere for the stormwater to go up top. It just, everything came down rather than um, being pruned. And so though finally, I have a little bit of a case study for you. This is one of our most egregious, and this kind of ties everything, that is not mine. This kind of ties everything together. So this is a site, and this is one of our most egregious scenarios. I will give you that. This is a complaint that actually Marguerite received when she was with enforcement several years ago. Um, it has a COSA, and I've got my notes here so I can get it right. So 45 years ago, in 1978, the original COSA was issued, and it states that there is a single family dwelling, and the drain field has to have a sufficient size to provide 280 square feet per bedroom. For a two bedroom area then, doing the math, that's 560 square feet. Uh, the original home is in orange, two bedroom, one bathroom, mobile home. We're good. Um, in 1994, a septic permit was issued, um, and it was uh, an issue for a 1,000 gallon tank and a 400 square foot drain field. That's in blue. Already, we are undersized based on the COSA to what the property is allowable. We have one known well, which is the purple dot in the lower left-hand corner. And all of that is what's supposed to be there. Orange, blue, purple. That is what is supposed to be on this lot. Uh, it's a little over two acres. Um, we also have in the middle, you can kind of see there's a, a, a drainage ditch that runs through that's part of the Yellowstone County um, MS4, their municipal separate storm sewer system. So that irrigation ditch also then feeds into um, a pipeline down the way. 
As you can see in yellow, they've added four properties. There has not been any submission for any sort of rewrite or deviation from their COSA since it was issued 45 years ago. Um, they are, let's see, what we have, so we've got the four additional homes. We allegedly have two unapproved septic tank systems somewhere on this property. We don't know where they are. We don't know if they're within the 100 foot exclusion zone for the well. We don't know if they've drilled another well to service these four properties. So we may have a multi-user well now instead of an individual well. Um, there's very shallow groundwater in this area. We don't know how those grain fields, if they exist, were put in and if they're contaminating groundwater. Um, we don't know if the ditch, um, there's actually two of them, but if they are sized appropriately to handle any of the stormwater that's coming off of the site or snow melt that's feeding into the MS4, and if it's not, is it flooding everything and contaminating? Um, and then, you know, and that, as you all know, the storm drain system ultimately discharges to surface water. And so we have all of that. Um, we don't know how many people are using the well. We don't know if it's multi-user at this point. Um, we don't know if the alleged drain fields are contaminating the well. And we won't know that until somebody gets sick. That's a huge problem because around this are also several homes where children live, where children are playing. Um, and in this case, um, as part of the complaint, it remains out of compliance. It's been, I don't know, about five years now, four years. So over those past several years, we have tried to contact the homeowners by phone several times. We have given five violation letters, three field inspections. They've met with Riverstone Health and they've still done nothing to comply. In this case, enforcement will go in, take formal administrative action, uh, order them to clean up the site, and that way we can be protective of our natural resources and the people that are living in the area. That's where enforcement comes in. When people don't comply, we try and provide them the assistance to comply. And that's what I have. Thanks. Thanks, with that, we're moving on to away from the DQ portion. Turn it over to you, counties. Are you up first? No, Shannon's going to do a little bit of science. Okay. Shannon first. Okay. That's great. Yep, so we have Shannon Terrio with Missoula County. She's going to be up first, and then we'll run through a handful of county folks. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. I'm Shannon. Um, you know, I want to step back just a second before I jump into the role of the local health departments. Um, we've heard about the um, Subdivision and Platting Act and how that interacts with the Sanitation and Subdivision Act. So, you know, Montana has these two subdivision acts that work together to create a better product. Actually, the Sanitation Act was around first. It was around um, since 1961, but it wasn't working well without the Platting Act, which is what Karen Alley um, referred to in her conversation. And I just want to say that the, the um, reason, the main reasons behind the Sanitation and Subdivision Act are kind of are really twofold. One is to protect public health and the environment, to make sure that wells and septic systems aren't located too close to bodies of water, too close to each other, so that people aren't drinking each other's waste. That's really important. And that we're not affecting the streams and the uh, rivers in a negative way, um, as Eric was talking about earlier. Um, and then there's the other side, which is the consumer protection side. And that is to make sure that once a uh, lot is created and it's sold and it's sold again, that it will be able to be used for its intended purpose. So I know every county has a situation where you can look back um, before 1961 and find uh, subdivisions with tiny little lots that have water running through it. And there's just no way to, de to develop those lots today in a way that would um, keep the, the septic systems and the wastewater apart. So 
keeping that in mind, that's really important. And when we look at sanitation and subdivision, we're really looking at four pieces. We're looking at um, the wastewater treatment and disposal. We're looking at drinking water quality. We're looking at stormwater disposal and solid waste disposal. And so you've heard from the experts about pieces of that, but I just wanted to give that kind of overall concept of what the um, Sanitation and Subdivision Act is doing. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we at the local level also integrate with that. And um, we're all pieces of the same pie um, and all meant to protect both the public health and the environment and um, to give some consumer protection so that lots can be used in the future for what they are being designed to be used for. Um, so I'm gonna start with some overarching authority and then um, we're going to have Beth from Lewis and Clark talk about some details about septic system permitting. And then um, Brittany from Gallatin will uh, talk about what happens um, our role as a contracted county um, during the DEQ review. So every city in, in Montana, we have a very decentralized public health system. That's great. It allows local control. It allows each county to, um, to work best in their community because we are a very large state and we're different from each other. So that's a good thing. And the, um, the state law in Title 50 supports that or creates that by requiring that every city and every class one and two county have a local board of health. They, they say there are a couple ways you can do this so that you know city of Missoula and the county of Missoula don't have to have a separate health department. So there's an allowance for a city county health department. There's even an allowance to allow counties to um, create an interlocal agreement and work together so that they have a district health department. and um, uh, you know, by far, county health departments are, are very, uh, we have mostly county health departments across the state, but um, there are several uh, large, uh, especially the larger counties have city county health departments. And in fact, um, uh, Lewis and Clark, Gallatin and Missoula are all city county health departments. Um, and so once everybody has a health department, then the, or a health board of health, creating a health department, but a board of health, then the state law gives powers and duties to that health department. So some are, you have to do these and some are, you can do these. And the have tos are things like, you have to have a health officer. Um, you have to inspect conditions of public health importance. And then the mays are, you may work, you may um, have uh, implement some rules and you, that, that you think are important to your county or you may enter into cooperative agreements with tribes. So that 50-2-116 has both of those. As we're talking about sanitation and subdivision review, um, there are aspects in both parts of those that apply. And so every county has to have, um, is required to have under state law, a, a um, or every health board, I'm sorry, depending on what, what kind of health board you have, has to have local uh, wastewater regulations to control sewage coming out of public and private buildings. And um, they have to be at least as stringent as the state standards. The state standards um, have in the past been created by the Board of Environmental Review. The last session um, replaced that authority and get, or to, gave that authority instead to the Department of Environmental Quality the other thing that happened during the last session is that instead of the health board adopting uh, the septic regulations, wastewater regulations um, that every board has to um, adopt, it says the health board must approve or must recommend for approval from the local governing body septic regulations. So um, they still all have to do it. Every county is going to have wastewater regulations. Those wastewater regulations are going to um, include permitting and inspection. Um, but it's, um, it's, uh, sorry, saw a little note. Um, okay, so I'm going to go on. Um, then the other aspect of this is that health boards may adopt some things that also kind of play into this, which is they may adopt rules, or I'm sorry, may uh, propose for adoption by the local governing body, 
rules for maintenance permits and rules to implement public health laws. And one of the rules to implement public health laws that circles back to the sanitation um, review is location of well permits. Not very many counties do this. I think only two have ever done it, but um, to have a well permit to say this is the location to ensure that the well is put in in the DEQ approved location or that it's at least um, 100 feet or more from all septic systems. Because before we had well permits, we weren't able to ensure that that was happening. And some wells were drilled very close to septic systems. Um, all right. So I, um, I have to find where I am. So, okay, how local um, permitting and state review of subdivisions fit together? So counties are the boots on the ground, and we really are largely responsible for the implementation of the DEQ approval, especially, like I said, for wastewater systems and a few counties also for well locations. Um, I talked earlier about the decentralization of public health in Montana, and in a state that's as large as Montana, that's really important. We have different geology, and that affects how well um, wastewater systems will treat the sewage or actually even get rid of the sewage, get rid of the wastewater. And then just our development patterns um, and how a, a group, you know, a, a more intensely um, developed area will uh, affect surface water bodies are different in different parts of the state. And so it makes sense that we would have local septic permitting um, to um, affect that and to, to think about the effects of septic systems on our waterways and on public health. Um, so for that reason, uh, the state laws and rules really support local permitting. And again, like the Plotting Act and the Sanitation Act are, are interconnected and interwoven and support each other, um, the state review of subdivisions also supports local permitting. And there are ways that are both in state law and in um, rule and even in the DEQ approval that supports that. Because ultimately what we wanna make sure of is that we're gonna be able to write a permit, write a septic permit on a parcel that's gone through DEQ approval as long as nothing's changed like floodplain um, when it's all said and done. So that when a parcel has been sold time and time again, that person isn't buying a um, parcel that can't be developed when they thought it could be. So just a couple of ways that that's supported is um, Title 76 Chapter 4 is the Sanitation and Subdivision Act. And that act does require certification from the local health officer uh, that wastewater systems will meet the local rules so that as a part of that review, um, make sure that the local rules are being considered when uh, during the DEQ review of the sanitation. Um, and then the local health officer is also appro uh, approval is also required before a plat or a survey or a townhome declaration can be filed with the clerk and recorder creating that parcel that um, or that townhome or uh, condo. So then also the rules follow that. They require that the local health officer um, approval be submitted as part of the um, as part of the application. And then it also requires uh, compliance with local requirements. And then finally, the certificate of subdivision approval, which is the DEQ approval for sanitation review, and it um, has to be filed in at the time when um, a plat or a, um, a survey or a townhome declaration is filed. Um, there's specific language that's included in, in that approval document that requires compliance with local rules. And so that compliance document, I don't think that we talked about earlier with DEQ, but it, it says what the, what the um, parcel has been approved for, what kind of wastewater system it needs to have and, and you know, size considerations and type considerations. It talks about the water supply, talks about stormwater, it talks about solid waste disposal, and it also includes the, um, the local rules. All right, I'm turning it over to Beth. Do I need to do anything different? Okay, very quickly, because I know we're running out of time. But um, Shannon already kind of covered a lot of a lot of this. I just want to talk a little bit about 
local permits, local variance procedures. Um, so Sherry talked about the authority under Title 50. It's those 900 rules, we affectionately call them, that local counties um, will say have to follow. We are mandated by the state of Montana to have to follow these rules. And that's the 1736-900. Um, <clears throat> and we have to adopt, like she said, regulations that are no less stringent for the disposal of sewage from pri private public buildings and facilities. It also, those 900 rules set forth those minimum standards for construction alteration, repair, extension for wastewater treatment systems. Um, if you looked at the lo local Lewis and Clark County regulations, you would almost see a mirror image of the 900 rules and our local regulations because we have to include those. Um, and then the, like Shannon said, we are mandated to adopt, administer a permit system. And that is also in those 900 rules. So they're really our bread and butter. They're how we administer our permit system and, and what we follow. The other piece, so those, those 900 rules, and then another piece is the circular DEQ4. Those are our, those are the design standards. They set forth the minimum standards for construction, size, and um, design of wastewater treatment systems. Again, cannot be less stringent. So whatever has been set forth, the local county cannot be less stringent than that. Um, and speaking on that, um, Title 50 also says something about if there's no comparable state standard, then you can adopt additional regulations. So that's kind of like a little what Shannon was talking about with well permits and whatnot. Um, a couple of the most common ones that I see are things like our certified installers program. There's nothing in the state rule that talks about how septic installers are regulated. So the local county, you know, their method for certifying septic installers may be different than another county. Um, the same with methods and standards for enforcement. So where we may assign a $500 penalty for a violation, another county might assess a different penalty or you know, however that works. So the processes and procedures for enforcement locally of those regs may change from county to county. But otherwise, what's in the 900 rules is has to at a minimum be in the local county regulations. You can be more stringent, but um, as it says in the 50-2130, um, you have to do a written finding that shows that it's protective of public health and that it's, it, it's justified. Um, and it also allows for petition of review of a rule. So there are some ways that counties can be more stringent, but we have to be very, consider that quite a bit, uh, what we want to do. And then local variances real quick. I know a lot of times there's a lot of verbiage, variances, waivers, deviations, you know, who, who does what? So variances, um, again, Title 50, um, the procedure for variances are set forth in the 900 rules and they can be granted as an exception to the 900 rules or the circular four, circular four in our case, only. So local board of health variances, we can't go ask for a variance from any state rule that we want to. It's either the 900 rules or the, the circular. Um, it's also important to note that if our local board of health denies a variance, that applicant can actually go appeal that to the Montana DEQ. So there is an appeal process. Um, so it's not always dead in the water. Uh, and they have to meet specific criteria. I'm not going to go into what those criteria are, but they're in the 1736-922 uh, for that. So again, local boards of health can't just be willy-nilly about accepting variances. They have very specific criteria that they have to meet. And how that relates with subdivision review, a local variance, um, you can technically get a local variance from your board of health, then go put that in your subdivision review application. But the DEQ, it still has to be in the form of a, we a weaver, <laughs> a waiver, or a deviation. So waivers are set for um, in anything in rule. So the waiver is rule, the deviation is circular. So we often work with the consultants and engineers and whatnot on what they are going to be asking for. Um, but that variance does need to be in their subdivision application to help support that waiver or deviation request. So that's, and it, this is way up here. I mean, it definitely gets into the weeds sometimes, but uh, that's the basics of it. And that's how it kind of comes together. Um, and then I think that that's it for me. Brittany, you're, you're up. 
Go. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Um, I think you, you guys can see me or no? No, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Well, uh, to be quick, I'm just going to take a few minutes of everybody's time here. So essentially, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's important that we continue with the contracted review. Um, I think we heard in, in public comment uh, in the last legislative session that most consultants were in support of continuing a local review program um, in the counties that do contract. And that covers a lot of things. Uh, I'm our, our timelines are, are typically better um, than DEQ. Sorry, DEQ. <laughs> um, we still, I mean, Gallatin County, and I'll show you a couple of slides we have, um, are constantly working on making sure that we stay that way. We still are issuing um, extensions, but nonetheless. Anyway, it's important because um, we need to be the coordinating sort of entity, right? We coordinate with the planners and, and the platting act, and we coordinate with a clerk and recorder about recording documents that create property and make sure the right exemption exists. We also notify DEQ if there's maybe an impaired waterway, or we have a high background nitrate sample on a local septic permit adjacent to a big subdivision that they might not otherwise know about, or if we have floodplain concerns or just this week, we had huge channel migrations in, in the Gallatin River. So floodplain has changed. Um, things like that, that we can help coordinate to make those reviews more consistent and get at the nuts and bolts of what we're here to do. And that's to make sure that um, we're issuing good permits, um, good subdivision approvals that meet the rules and can stand for time. Um, we also are the boots on the ground, like Shannon said, we're going out looking at the dirt work on site, um, groundwater monitoring, those sorts of things. Things. We also have historical data um, that's from staff that have been in counties for many, many years. And there's also lots of GIS specific data. In Gallatin County, we have several um, studies that map the um, gradient and direction of groundwater flow. And that is something specific to our area that otherwise wouldn't apply to other counties. Um, and we also coordinate with Susan and DEQ enforcement on compliance work. Um, and oftentimes we're sort of following that file from compliance all the way through subdivision review, all the way through installing that septic system, um, issuing a permit to operate and closing the case. Beth, if you'd switch the slides here. Last slide, guys, don't worry. <laughs> um, this is our Wastewater Permit and Sanitation Act review time uh, sort of growth curve, I guess. Um, and this is these are the pieces that we use to support uh, an addition of another sanitarian here in Gallatin County in the um, sort of land side, which is septic permits in contracted counties. And the purple line on the top there is the number of wastewater treatment permits issued. And that goes from the start of the fiscal year cumulatively to the end of the fiscal year. And we're above that and have stayed above that the last um, four years. And then the number of subdivision applications received chart on the bottom, fiscal year 2022 is in green. What isn't reflected there is the number of lots within those application. Um, so not only are we having more applications, but those applications also include additional lots. So um, five years ago, I was reviewing files that maybe just had one or two lots. And now I'm reviewing big subdivisions that have 10, 30, 50, 100 and however many lots. Um, so that's just a straight number of applications, again, not reflecting the number of lots. And then lastly, oh, my box didn't highlight it. Sorry, guys. Uh, there was a revision to the state uh, statute 764105 that does allow local authority, i.e. a contracted county to establish a fee to review applications. Um, and this is going to be used to supplement uh, the local authority's ability to maintain a contracted review program, which helps uh, us weather the storm when we have these uh, extreme growth curves like we're seeing across the state. Um, Missoula County has adopted this and uh, we are going to look into this uh, to supplement that program and make sure that we're keeping all the files that we can locally to help DEQ through um, the current staff shortage, which we're doing, doing currently. I think that's all I was going to cover. So thanks, guys. Great. Thank you, Shannon, Beth, and Brittany. Oh, I think it is it's about 11.39, so we're running about nine minutes behind, but we do still have plenty of time for a Q&A. Um, and we 
attempted to set up a table at the front of the room. So for folks who did present today, um, if you could join us at the front of the room. And then everyone online, if you have questions, will you please either raise your hand or type them in the chat or in the Q&A? <laughs> okay. Seeing a few questions coming in in the Q and A. Maybe we had one. We had one in there for a while, so I'll start with that. Came from someone anonymous, so it's very mysterious. But the, the question is also kind of a statement, but they say, "I know everyone's busy, and circumstances have impacted statutory review timelines." How do MFEs with engineering review fit into the DEQ's current review process? Specifically, I don't believe the engineering review timelines are statutory and therefore seem to be unpredictable, at least from the outside looking in. The checklists indicate these are typically seven to, day, to 10 day timelines. I realize that's not realistic with today's circumstances. Who wants to take that one? Sure, what was the first part? First part, how do MFEs with engineering review fit into the DEQ's current review process? Okay, so an MFE is not a subdivision approval. It is an exemption, but what it is, is it's sort of a certificate where DEQ acknowledges that the exemption is acceptable. Um, but it does hinge on municipal facilities um, and a, uh, you know, that the city engineer is going to vouch for, it could be a contract, it, with the city, but a city engineer is going to vouch for the fact that these facilities meet the city requirements and are at least as stringent as DEQ's requirements. Uh, so that's how that fits into it. And, you know, it is usually accompanied by a main extension, which is an extension of water or wastewater pipe um, that serves more than one residence or commercial unit. Uh, so on the, the MFEs are processed within a week, their administrative process, um, unless there is some hang up where we don't think that the project qualifies for the exclusion. I um, mean, usually this comes in uh, issues with the, the, the engineers um, not being as familiar with the Sanitation Act and the exclusions um, and some issues with maybe the plat not recording the, the proper things. Uh, but Generally, those are processed within, within a week by our administrative staff. Uh, the main extensions are different. The timelines for the public water plan review are not in statute, they are in rule. Um, and the expedited process is, it says review times are normally this long. Um, in this case, you know, if we have half the engineers and at least three times the work uh, there's really no way to make things go faster without adding staff and implementing some of those strategies that we talked about. Great. Does anyone else have anything to add? Okay. We have another question. Then where can we find additional information for counties that may be interested in becoming contractors? Uh, they just need to send me your contact information. <laughs> If you didn't hear that, please send contact information to Marguerite or as Thomas at DEQ, and we will get right back to you because we would love that. <laughs> yes. All right. Next question online we have pursuant to ARM 1730-716-3, a 100 foot provisional mixing zone is required. What if there is a public water supply? The verbiage is a bit confusing. If you have no well, is this applicable? As far as uh, I guess I don't understand the question. Um, if, if you're talking about a cistern, you know, it's something that's sealed, um, and I think there is a different setback. I don't have that information. Uh, if it's a public well, then you're, you're very limited in sources of contamination that you can have within that well radius. Um, and, you know, a mixing zone, drain field, a sewer pipe, um, all of those things would have to go before the 
the deviation committee and they're unlikely to have. Does that answer the question? Not hearing any anything or seeing anything else in the chat. So go ahead and move on. Are there any questions in the room before we get back to the ones online? If you have one, if you could just introduce yourself and then speak up. I'll I'll all conversation going on. I'm Sam Still. I handle cover publications for my association of realtors. Uh, back in the 2019. Interim, uh, the department raised its subdivision review fees and other related fees. Uh, what um, the I guess the regulated community got in return for paying the higher fees, or what uh, we were, I guess, uh, but what the understanding was was that those increases in fees would be used to hire both more and more experienced reviewers. Um, you know, COVID happened, we understand the, the ramifications of that, but I noticed that uh, one of the strategies the subdivision review program is considering is, uh, I guess, what would look to be the increased compensation. So I'm curious, you know, what, how are you uh, uh, planning to uh, fund those um, increases in, in compensation? And then, two, what are we going to, do, you know, go down the Route of trying to increase fees again. What are you going to do this time to have the increase in fees translate to better service? Because I've had um, more complaints from the regulated community than I've ever had in the last, you know, several years since that increase in fees and services have back up worse. So I'm just curious uh, how, how you're planning to, uh, you know, as you explore. Increased compensation, how you're going to fund it, and then what's that going to look like? How's it going to translate in terms of uh, better service? Sure. Um, the issue that we have right now is not with the lack of fees. We have lots of cash flow. Um, you know, of course, lots of projects, lots of cash flow. Uh, the issue is that we are limited in our appropriation by the governor's office. Um, so we cannot expand beyond that appropriation um, without their permission, and it's an involved process. Um, so one, losing three engineers, so we're just backfilling there. Um, and two, as you mentioned, um, not all engineers are equivalent, so someone who's on day one is not going to be equivalent to someone who's on year 10 um, in any profession. Uh, but also, the fee increase um, was to make the 2019 level of applications work for us. Um, we are not operating at the 2019 level, we're operating at the 2023 level, which is somewhere between three and six times as much. We did not raise our fees three to six times as much. Um, number two, uh, so no, if we are increasing compensation or contracting or doing any of those things, we are using money that we already have. Um, the other idea would be to use some general fund or use some public water fees, but currently we can stay within that. Um, what, what I proposed to the director, and I think he's going to propose to the governor, was that we need two additional reviewers beyond uh, full staff. Um, and the you know, minimum scenario, best case scenario, would be we need five more um, in order to keep up with the load that we have. The only thing I would add is that we were able to transfer some appropriation, so we do have the, the appropriation that we need yeah. Thank you. Can I add to what you were saying? Um, just as a practical matter, right now, labor shortage is certainly a skill. Even if they got the money, uh, they may not be able to fill those positions. I work up in any private consultant. We can't hire people to take these experience. We can't. It's impossible. It's, you have to steal. And unfortunately, it's harder for them to get people to do this for us. So right. it's um, a big problem in the industry. Yeah. And, 
and, and it's a two prong issue. Um, one is that our compensation isn't what they could get in private industry. And two is that our work life balance is worse because we have, um, as a consultant, you can say no when you've exceeded your capacity to um, you know, take on work. But although at, at this time it's very difficult for consultants to do that, I understand that. But um, you know, there is some ability to do that, which we cannot do in the state of take long. Um, but you know, that's a good point because I've had that engineering um, position open since uh, I think March. Um, and I'm only now going to offer the final position. I have only we interviewed three candidates, and there were three that we could offer to. Um, so it's not like we haven't been working on it. It's just that yeah, we can't find people to do it, and I can't pick someone who's really inexperienced when we're in this crisis. All right, I'm going to go back to question online. Why does the dedication statement on flats say dedicated to the public now and forever? I was told by a NATO attorney that the dedication statement does not allow for the future installation of water, sewer, and other public utilities within the dedicated right of way. Is it solely for public access purposes? It seems contrary to the intent of the dedication to the public and public uses. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the language that's on final plots that you see is actually uh, governed by the regulations, not only in uh, 17 or 17 of the regulations, but also under the rules for surveyors. Um, since it's surveyors, uh, professional land surveyors that are putting in a lot of this information. Um, as far as dedicated to public use, it really kind of depends on they're talking about roads dedicated to public use or parklands or what um, the actual specific dedication encapsulates. So I'm not, I'm not sure that I can answer that in a satisfactory way other than the typical lawyer answer that it depends. Um, but it really does depend on what, what part of the flat is actually dedicated to public use. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> We'll go on to the next one. And it looks like this might be for you, Eric Chum. So Eric Chum mentioned between 6% and 50% of nitrogen pollution in the flathead comes from septic systems. Approximately how many septic systems have actually been sampled, forming the basis for projections in the modeling? And does DEQ have the raw sample data available for public review? Eric, I can. I can. Attack that if you like. Um, so the for individual septic systems, we don't generally sample them. Um, and what we use in the calculations for determining how much nitrogen gets to surface water are published values by EPA based on. Uh, multiple studies of what typically comes out of a residential septic system, flow, nitrogen, phosphorus, all that. The, the, the final number that Eric referenced is what gets to surface water, and that's the difficult part to determine. There's very little, uh, very little information out there regarding how to calculate that, and that's what the means program does. It estimates how much actually gets to surface water. Um, so as far as what's actually coming out of septic systems, I think we have a fairly good um, number on that. On average, every septic system is gonna be a little bit different, but on average, it's pretty well established. Um, however, to, to answer the question about sampling, um, A, we have um, our permitted systems in the department. Um, I don't know how many dozens or hundreds there are, and they are, they're all required to sample their wastewater. Um, I showed some of the examples in my talk of, of data. So there is that data for larger systems. For individual systems, um, we are in the process. We're trying, trying to set up a meeting in the next month or so with level two providers only um, because they're required to collect data based on our rules. And we are gonna collect that data and that data will be available publicly. 
Um, so sometime later this this year, hopefully, we'll have that database available. Also, the the permit database of of the permit um, information um, from those permits from, is available already on database. You contact the permits uh, program, where you can contact me. I put you in, in touch with someone if you want specific data from their from their systems. Thanks, Eric. The only other thing I'd add is that six to fifty percent. That's individual water bodies. Like there, some of the water bodies within that flathead DMPL document. You know, six percent uh, was out. Or the modeled contribution was six percent, and I know that Spring Creek, it's a tributary to Ashley Creek, was the highest there at fifty percent, and it just had very few other sources. Nice. I'm going to jump down to one more online because it looks like it's a follow up from the first question related to MFEs. The question is Are the main extension reviews associated with MFEs being equally prioritized with the standard subdivision reviews? And, the, and there's a comment that says It's been a challenge to tell contractors that we have city approval but not DEQ and to be unsure on what the timeline may be. Sure. Um, so what we've done with the main extensions is, um, you know, the reviewers have them listed in chronological order, but because the main extensions have a shorter time frame, they've been sort of alternating those with the subdivision reviews. Because if we only did main extensions, no one would ever get their subdivision approved. Um, so th that's kind of how we've been doing this sort of um, uh, alternating approach. The other things that we're working on, main extensions will be the things that we can, you know, farm out the most with our other strategies. So taking from other state departments, taking from within the EQ, um, and you know, hiring contractors. The other thing we're working on is contracting with larger municipalities to perform those reviews um, as is allowed in the public water supply laws. So that answers the question. Thanks, Marguerite. One more online, and then we'll do check on in the room again. Um, is there additional training or continuing education that can be found through DNRC on water rights, water right exemptions, and closed basins? Maybe I saw your pop on. Looks like you're ready to answer that one. <laughs> I am ready to answer that one. Um, yeah, great question. Um, so we do have uh, a realtor training that we do, and I, I know that. Um, involves credits for for realtors um that training is is really a water rights 101 i i know it does focus on on ownership updates but but it encompasses all of of water rights it's a, it's a pretty good uh basic training on on what you need to know um our website does have information on closed basins. Uh, it's also got the guidance on combined appropriation if you're interested in looking at that. Um, we are actually working on updating our website right now. So over the next, I think six months or so, you guys are gonna see a, a major overhaul to our website because uh, we're trying to improve functionality there. Um, and then as well with the, the water process overhaul that we're doing, along with the website update. Uh, we're working to develop more clear, concise information for uh, our water users, and that does involve uh, outreach and, and training. Um, and I guess I would just encourage folks, if you have specific questions um, as you're working through projects, uh, the local water resources offices are, are really good resources because they're gonna have that localized knowledge um on on issues in the areas that that they they work in or just things that you may have to be aware of that are probably a little bit more complicated and technical and, and um area specific so hopefully that answers that that question if not uh yeah let me know and i can do a follow-up thanks Nate. um if you don't mind would you drop the website uh, link into the chat so folks can find it. I know you're doing an overhaul, but maybe they'd like to check today. Yeah, no problem. All right. Other questions in the room? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I got a question. Uh, Derek Brandon, Avatar, um, and I think it's for me. Just uh, 
to uh, you know clarify some math in the water right uh, well exemptions. Uh, talk about uh, projects less than 10 acre feet, which is uh, basically three thousand or three million gallons. Um, just trying to figure out some of the math as far as what size uh, project you could do without having to actually buy extra water rights. Um, and uh, so with that said, there's, uh, you know, my numbers, you know, you divide that by 365. And then I think the average household uses about 300 gallons a day. So, you know, roughly 29 uh, lots you could do without having to buy additional water rights. And I guess, is that correct? Or is that Pretty sure that's not correct. What what numbers do you use to uh, figure out where you don't have to buy additional water rights? Okay, so I, I I think I heard most of that question. Um, so it it really depends on the project. There's no set scale of if you do X number of lots you're gonna be okay because it, it depends on the, the plan for water use on the project. So if, if there's separate systems for uh, domestic use in lawn and garden, you may be able to have more domestic connections because uh, maybe lawn and garden, and I know this is common in, in the Bozeman area, lawn and garden is provided through uh, surface water, you know, contract or a ditch company or, an existing irrigation surface water right. So um, there's no set rule on like number of lots um, just because of, of all the different uh, details that, that go into uh, figuring out that water use. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> It tried yes. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Uh, a question about the modeling of nature contamination where it comes from on the planet. I'm curious, I guess, looking at, at the modeling where we have a range of uh, on site wastewater systems contributing anywhere from 6% to you know, at the very highest at 50% of the nitrates in some of these waters in Platte County. Uh, you know, we can't get the, you know, the inverse of those. I mean, I think in most cases, on-site wastewater systems actually amount to you know, less than a majority of the nitrates um, in these bodies of water. So with that being the case, I'm curious if the or DEQ has taken a look at uh, or tried to model the relative proportions of other non-point sources such as uh, um, you know, agriculture, whether it's fertilizer or whatever it may be. Has DEQ tried in any way to quantify some of those other sources of nitrates? Yeah, I can take it, and Eric Regensberger can chime in because he developed the model the, for the Flathead TMDL. We used a broader watershed scale LSPC model, is what it's called. He recently um, updated some of the inputs to that, um, but it does identify, you know, broad sources of not point, you know, like agriculture. Um, let's see the chart I have here, but I, it, we do try and do that, and it, and it's we quantify with percent, um, percent contribution as well as um, load reduction to meet that TMPL. So we do that in categories, which includes septic system, um, agriculture, uh, stormwater not related to the permitted NS4. Uh, so, but I think within that TMDL document, the reduction was to all non-point sources. You know, it was an aggregate reduction of close to 90% for a lot of these water bodies, for, for Ashley Creek, that lower end part of Ashley Creek. Um, so does that, I, you know, and, and some of the monitoring that we do helps further, I, you know, identify specific sources where those might be coming from. But it was done through that broader LSPC model. And Eric, I don't know if you want to go into detail on that um, or the update to that. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I can just give a quick a quick answer. So, yeah, there were other point sources accounted for in that model. It included agriculture. It included golf courses. It included timber harvest. It included uh, forest fire. Um, so, yeah, they they were all included in some of those pie charts. I can't remember Eric's what it looked like, but um, in some cases, in some watersheds, some of those non-point sources were so small they weren't they didn't even register on the on the pie chart, but they were all they were all accounted for. Thank you. Brittany, I see your hands raised. Did you want to jump in? Yep, I was just going to jump in and say that it's uh, in Gallatin County, we've had several of those studies completed by the local water quality district. So if you're looking for specific, more site uh, focused information, those local water quality districts can be great resources. We had a couple of studies in a couple of areas that have uh, crazy high background nitrates. Um, so that can also be helpful. Great, thanks. Any other questions in the room or online? I see there are a couple more comments in the Q&A related to the MAPO question from earlier, but they look like more comments. So just for whoever it was who asked that question, I will make sure that those get passed on to Karen before we leave today and she'll follow up. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Ask just one last question. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, I think this is from my uh, On, I know you know the rewriting subdivision standards, uh, and one one of the things that you know just is like with uh, me is that uh, stormwater retention, and you know that's just gone hugely in the field zone. And there's there's things that happen like you know we're experiencing right now that are just events that you know you're not going to get around. You know, it's something that, that there's going to be damage. And, but you know, some of the stuff like underwater or hundred year events, as far as doing storm retention, hundred year events seems ridiculous. And I was wondering if there's any way that anybody's got a cost benefit analysis of that because you know if you have half your acreage basically you know set aside for storm water retention. It just makes absolutely no sense in you know time when you know plans are very delicate. Uh sure. So I don't know if there was a cost benefit when they implemented that more robust stormwater circular. Uh what I would say is that the hundred year flood is not all that uncommon. Um, and I've been out on a number of sites where yes, they met all the requirements of the subdivision approval, but they were still flooded. Um, and so the hundred year is actually um, kind of a middle of the road type of retention requirement. And so that's that's why we picked that. It's, it's not um, because the, the, the problem with stormwater is that when the damage occurs, it's very expensive um, because it just you know destroys property, destroys roads, um, and people. You know, involved in lawsuits against each other and the EQ is involved. Um, so they're just, it's a really expensive thing when it does go wrong. It's a problem. Well, we are officially, I think we were nine minutes over and we're about nine minutes over still. So thank you everybody so much for joining us today. This was informational at least, and we've got a bunch of names now who we can reach out to if you have further questions. We did record the seminar today, so we'll, we'll figure out how to make that available to everybody. Um, one last note, if you are in the room and you'd like to receive a certificate of completion, there is a, a sign-in sheet in the back. If your name's not on it, we just add your full name and email address, and we'll make sure that that certificate gets back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. 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 Okay